Hello, I'm Professor Jeff Yarger. I'm going to be introducing fundamental concepts in thermodynamics today. And thermodynamics is really asking, you know, what is going on with energy? And so we can start with what is energy, which is actually more complicated to define than you would think. So as put even in the Encyclopedia Britannica, this is something that's very difficult to define precisely. And we can think of it as, you know, anything that produces an effect typically has an energy associated with it. So, and really thermodynamics is the macroscopic study of energy in its various forms. And we'll see this as we go through it. Um, but one of the first things to keep in mind about thermodynamics is it is a macroscopic theory. So microscopic theories like classical mechanics, where for every single particle or element or compound or atom or whatever we're talking about, we define position and momentums for all of these. And in uh, what took over classical mechanics to quantum mechanics, we define a probabilistic wave function that has the probability of every one of these components or atoms or, or molecules, et cetera, and their position and, and, and how they evolve in time, and how the wave function and probabilistic waves evolve in time, et cetera. Well, when we're talking about a macroscopic system with 10 to the 23, a mole of particles or a mole of atoms or a mole of... Um, uh, um, you know, compounds, uh, uh, et cetera, this is, you know, a, a ton of variables to keep in track of. So uh, if you take a lot of these microscopic theories and then play them through probabilistic statistics, you find that out what comes out is a macroscopic theory, thermodynamics, which defines things with macroscopic variables with many fewer variables to define the complete state of a system, especially when you're working in kind of reversible or equilibrium, slow dynamic uh, type of systems. And so this is really the study of thermodynamics. And to give a little motivation for this, I think uh, this quote uh, states it best by Einstein. Of, of all, you know, a lot of times what we're looking for in theory is, is simplicity. Uh, and of all the theories he was familiar with at the time, and he was there for the evolution of quantum mechanics and everything else, that the one thing he was most convinced of is, is that you know, uh, classical thermodynamics would probably not be overthrown. It's such a, a, a well-established, elegant theory, uh, and it, it has been tested and tried in the macroscopic world, the world in which we live so often. So hopefully that gives a little motivation for why of any uh, fundamental topic in physics that we're going to learn as chemists, thermodynamics is probably um, you know, the most important and, and definitely the most used because we're typically working in the macroscopic world. Um, so let's go through and, and introduce this by introducing some of the con, uh, concepts. And, and it starts with getting a little vernacular or vocabulary and some of the terminology associated with it. So usually when we're talking about thermodynamics, um, we define a part of the universe that we're interested in looking at. We'll call that the system. Everything else in the universe we'll call the surroundings. And then usually there's something that constrains or divides the system from the universe. Sometimes it's imaginary, sometimes it's real constraints, sometimes uh, they're uh, conditional over time, etc. But those constraints or walls uh, often you know, define a lot of the vernacular vocabulary we use in thermodynamics. So, for example, things you remember from already from, from introductory chemistry uh, physics class, almost every science class you've had some type of thermodynamics uh, in the past is, is that, you know, when you can, you consider a system open when you can flow particles or number of moles of, of different atoms or molecules or compounds back and forth between the system and the surrounding, we call that open, where matter is allowed to flow uh, back and forth. And it's open to energy if we allow energy to go back and forth between the two. Well, if you use constraints or walls that keep that from happening, we'll call that a closed system. And if you close it to the point of not just closing off where matter can go through it, but not even energy or heat or anything can transfer in and out from the system to the surroundings, we could call that an isolated system. Um, so that gives you some of the um, vernacular. Um, 
a list here, which we won't go through exhaustively, but uh, these are in lecture notes and, and is typically covered very well in, in the textbook uh, we use in, in thermodynamics as well as most textbooks. Uh, but this just gives you a sense of, of some of the uh, terminology we use in thermodynamics. So we're usually looking at different heat effects and work effects. And so when you restrict uh, using walls or your constraints to restrict uh, the heat in a system and you don't allow the heat to change, so that we can say uh, uh, DQ or the change in heat is zero, then that's considered an adiabatic system. Um, and if you allow it uh, heat to go back and fo uh, forth or, or you don't restrict that, we typically call it diathermal or that you allow thermal fluctuation across it, right? Uh, if instead of restricting the heat, the total amount of heat, but you just restrict temperature from not, uh, from staying the same in the system, we call that isothermal, that we, and that means there's no change in, um, in temperature during some uh, thermodynamic process. Uh, if we, as we already mentioned, if we stop the number of moles, which we usually use a capital N for, or matter, we use a small M for that, uh, we don't allow it to go back and forth between the system and the surroundings, we call it closed, otherwise it's open. Um, oftentimes as chemists, we're not talking about the total amount of matter, but we're talking about individual components. So for example, in air, maybe we allow just the oxygen to permeate in and out between the system and the surroundings. So that's semi-permeable to certain components. And then instead of talking the total number of moles, capital N, we usually use a sub I to indicate the ith component or some number of components uh, within a more complicated system. And again, if we don't restrict that, it's open. Um, if we restrict hard, rigid walls so that it's a fixed volume, then that's isochoric. Um, however, if we allow more pr uh, flexible walls, kind of like what we think of ideally as a balloon, but we restrict, in a sense, the force per unit area or the pressure uh, and allow the volume to expand or contract uh, based on that external force, then uh, that's uh, by restricting the pressure so there's no change in pressure. Uh, dp is equal to zero. We call that uh, isobaric. Um, and then again, if we restrict the total amount of energy, the internal energy in the system, and again, energy usually is a capital E is what uh, is used most commonly, but in thermodynamics, we're almost always putting things from the system's perspective, not the entire universe, just the part of the universe we're interested in. And so that's typically in most textbooks and most uh, um, uh, notes consider, use a capital U for internal energy or, or just the energy of the system. And again, if we restrict that and it's isolated and you can't change that, it's an isolated system and otherwise it's an open system. So, um, this lens to thermodynamics is a macroscopic um, theory that the uh, variables are, are macroscopic in nature. And let's go through some of the common ones we run across when we're looking at uh, thermodynamic um, or how, how macroscopic systems change and, and the theory you use. So I put at the top composition for a very specific reason. This is designed for a biochemistry or chemistry audience. And the number one thing that we're doing macroscopically as chemists or biochemists is you define chemistry by changing chemical compositions, by doing reactions, which means changing compounds or molecules or adding things together, breaking them apart. So we're, by our very nature as chemists, the, the most important macroscopic function we're looking at is the number of moles. Uh, in the system or, or how matter is changing, but specifically how different components within a system are changing. And so we usually use the capital N for the total number of moles, and that can be the sum over, um, you know, however many ith components there are, right? And so thermodynamics is always each energy term for the energy of the system, the internal energy, can be broken up into uh, conjugate you know, uh, field energy variable sets. So, uh, and they're always extensive, intensive, you know, in nature. So the total number of particles is an extensive quantity. 
uh, to remind you from freshman chemistry or, or physics how I think of intensive and extensive. Uh, an, an intensive variable is something that if you take a system and you doubled it and you say, did you know, the variable of interest double or change as well. So for example, if we just take theoretically a little, uh, you know, a couple centimeters cubed right here, and I said, you know, how many particles are in there right now? Um, and I say, and now I double that box, and I say, how many particles? Well, you know, that number doubled as well. Um, so the total number of moles probably doubled, or the amount of matter doubled. But if I ask, what's the pressure in this little box, and then I double it, what's the pressure of double that box? The pressure stayed the same. So that's an intensive parameter, while one uh, that stays the same as you double it, uh, the extensive one is one that typically scales with the size of the system. And it's also very important to keep in mind that every single one of these extensive parameters here um, are typically used in an intensive way. And, and so you can make everything, as a chemist, we almost make every extensive variable intensive just by dividing by the number of moles. So if you take you know, the ith component and divide by the total number of moles, you know, then it becomes intensive, it doesn't change. You know. Um, so if you take the total volume, but you, um, uh, you know, in, instead you take the molar volume, so the total volume, the volume divided by the, the total number of moles, uh, et cetera, you can see how this plays out. And even entropy, we typically do it over uh, molar entropy, et cetera. So this is one way to, uh, a common way that we make these extensive parameters intensive in nature. But uh, the natural extensive have uh, intensive pair matches. So, um, you know, the, the conjugate variable to the total number of moles is its chemical potential, its potential, um, you know, to, to react, to do chemistry uh, for each one of those components. For volume, its intensive uh, pair is, is the pressure, you know, the, the force per unit area. You can take it from a volume which is looking at uh, three-dimensional space, and you can take it down to two-dimensional space, like an area, uh, and then its intensive is its, its surface tension, or one-dimensional, just the length, and, and then that goes as, in a sense, it's, it's um, uh, the tension or the force on that. Um, we can go do things with, uh, you know, electrical charge instead, and this is, you know, uh, electrons, electrical charge, a lot of electrochemistry, et cetera. We can do magnetic fields and look at, again, like the magnetic moment um, and its uh, uh, associated um, potential, you know, magnetic field, um, for example. And then finally, the one I, I include at the bottom, which is heat. So all of these, you know, represent you know, different types of what we generally just call work. So this would be the most familiar, which is what we generally think of as just mechanical work, how PDV work or pressure volume work. Um, but, you know, this is, you know, chemical work in a sense. This is how chemistry uh, changes things, et cetera. And then this is how, this is electrical work and magnetic work, et cetera. But besides having these, in a sense, mechanical or work type, chemical and mechanical work type terms, we also have, in a sense, something that gives us a relation to the microscopic, which is, you know, how the temperature and what we're going to be defining in this course and trying to understand more and more, which is the entropy of a system, how it changes. And this gives us a direct relationship, entropy, to information, Shannon theory, to, to fundamental uh, formulation for what information is, for what a bit of information is, it has far-reaching implications in uh, that as well as to the microscopic, to quantum mechanics, to classical mechanics, to uh, individual particles and, and how these configurations change um, and how they change and, and can cause propagation of, of heat. So each one of these conjugate variables, like temperature into entropy, like pressure into volume, like chemical potential into the number of moles, right? They come as conjugate pairs, and they get added or subtracted 
um, you know, to the overall energy. Each one of them are energy terms themselves. Pressure volume is an energy. Temperature, uh, the change in entropy is, a, is an energy. The chemical potential into its, the number of uh, moles of each one of those is, a, is an energy. And then we just add or subtract those to give the overall energy of the system. So energy is so fundamental in typically what we're looking at thermodynamics that we look at it in several different ways. And so, uh, you know, this shows the ones that are typically most used you know, in biochemistry or chemistry, which is we look at them by looking at the uh, energy and then basically manipulating these conjugates around which, which one is the dependent variable versus the independent variable. Um, so we do that by reformulating the overall energy of the system into different, you know, more or less forms of energy, which are all in a sense different uh, so we look at the Helmholtz energy, often called the Helmholtz free energy, or the Gibbs energy, um, the enthalpy uh, of the system, et cetera. I would say in chemistry, it's typically the enthalpy and Gibbs free energy we end up looking at most. And this changes the natural variables. The natural variables for the internal energy are how the entropy changes, how the volume changes in the number of moles. But by switching to, for example, the Gibbs free energy, which is defined here, now we switch that from not the entropy as the dependent variable, but the temperature, and not the volume, but the pressure as being the, the variables that we look at as, as far as changing. And it even points to why often as chemists, we focus so much on the Gibbs free energy, which is oftentimes you wanna look at how chemistry happens. That's how the number of moles of something changes. But you don't wanna change multiple variables at the same time. So practically as chemists, it's typically much easier to hold the temperature and pressure of a reaction constant so that you can really look at what's going on in the number of moles in the system than it is, for example, to look at the internal energy directly where you would have to hold the entropy and the volume of a system uh, constant to be able to really focus in just on the chemistry of the change in the number of moles of a system. I also like to point out like a lot of this information, this fundamental information, while it's in lots and lots, thermodynamics is a very um, uh, established theory and, and books have been written about it since the Industrial Revolution, um, you know, but Wikipedia, you know, has excellent um, you know, fundamental uh, examples and, and goes through this in, in, in really good detail. So um, with those, you know, potentials that we do, we usually, you know, look at what we kind of define as, you know, um, you know, the first, you know, law of, of thermodynamics, which is, is looking at, um, you know, that there's, that energy is conserved in a system. And we can, you know, define energy in terms of either heat or different types of work. And, and generally in chemistry, we're not dealing with magnetic work or electric work, et cetera. Um, but we often do separate out chemical work because it's the what we're looking at most often as chemists, right? And so heat always has a unique term to it. And we're gonna look at this in a lot more detail. In fact, we'll have a completely separate video on, on thermodynamic laws and, and, and or postulates that kind of define uh, the field. This is meant to be more of a general overview. Um, but heat always comes as this term that we're gonna look at in a lot more detail, which is entropy. Um, work, usually we define mechanical work by just how it changes its pressure volume relation. But, and it's often called extra work when it's a surface tension or when it's an electric charge or when it's a magnetic field, et cetera. But again, as chemists, we almost always separate out chemical work because this is often why we're doing thermodynamics is to see if or to predict whether a reaction will happen or not or what the changes are in different reactions and how the number of moles are changing. Can we predict it, et cetera? So this is usually whereas chemists and biochemists we stop. 
And this is often called the combined first second law, or really the, what I think of as the fundamental equation I write down most often in thermodynamics. 90% of thermodynamic problems I start right here. So, and just to give you a brief sense of, of kind of where we're heading, we're gonna look at some of the mathematics as well in the near future and kind of how you get from here to here. In other words, how you change the internal energy to these other more use, or oftentimes more useful uh, forms of, of energy that we wanna look at in a system. Like for example, again, the Gibbs free energy when if we hold temperature and pressure constant you know, the change in the Gibbs free energy just goes as how the number of moles in the system uh, changes, which is often seminal in chemistry to be able to look at. And this is looking at, at Legendre transforms, how we go from uh, these changes. And again, it's covered on this Wikipedia. And we'll cover this in a mathematical uh, examples in, um, in thermodynamics in a future uh, lecture. So, I like to also summarize something that again was uh, uh, is uh, given to you in Wikipedia, but it kind of also states why these different um, uh, thermodynamic potentials are important, and it, it's also important to say that there's a convention to what we consider uh, positive uh, heat and positive work, et cetera, and it's kind of shown here, and this often causes a lot of practical confusion when working problems is bookkeeping, whether we're talking about, um, you know, we, the convention is, is that heat is positive going into the system and work is positive coming, you know, when it's done by the system on its surroundings. So as summarized here. And by, in a sense, you know, mixing up these conventions, it, it can cause a lot of practical headache when working problems. Um, I like to mention that, but, but what we do is often practically try to make it as easy for us as possible. And because this macroscopic theory, as we'll see when we look at some of the mathematics, allows us to define very few macroscopic variables that define the complete thermodynamic state of the system, we often look for natural variables that you know, are held constant so that we can look at some specific component, like I've already stated. Like, so while the change in internal energy is how the overall uh, energy changes, the change in the Gibbs free energy is the non-mechanical work done on the system, or in other words, the chemical work on a system. And often that's what we, it's why we use this so often in chemistry to look at whether, uh, predict whether a reaction will happen or not for example. Uh, the other thing I want to, you know, uh, enthalpy is very common to look at because again, it's the non-mechanical work that we're looking at, as well as the heat, which we all know as uh, chemists, we often, you know, have some control over temperature. We're interested in entropy effects, uh, et cetera. Finally, I mentioned this for completeness, but we rarely talk about the Helmholtz free energy. Uh, in physics, it's almost, it's, it's commonly represented as a capital F. In chemistry, biochemistry, it's typically a capital A for Helmholtz free energy. And it's because this does have, uh, is basically the overall total work in the system. And, and, and just generally, it's, it's, it's not that very, it, it's not nearly as applicable for experimental chemists and biochemists. Um, but that said, one of the things is in computational, where you can, Hold vol where it's, it's much easier to hold volume fixed in a computational system, while experimentally it's often much easier to hold pressure fixed in a system. Uh, but you'll say I introduced this even though we won't be using it much practically uh, in biochemical thermodynamics. And so this just, again, re-summarizes some of the things we're gonna look at in the future. We're gonna go through some of the mathematical relationships. We're gonna look at all the laws that really, um, you know, allow us to derive this equation um, and, and these, et cetera. I'll mention one other thing, which is sometimes you see this as a negative work when they define um, it as positive uh, PDV. Uh, and so again, this often comes as a convention Finally, I wanna say where we're uh, heading after this introduction, um, we're gonna look at, in a sense, the laws or postulates that allow us to formulate um, this basic equation in thermodynamics and use it uh, 
uh, to solve practical problems. We're gonna spend an entire uh, lecture just looking at some of the mathematics in thermodynamics so that we feel comfortable uh, with this and, 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 um, and we're, because it's really um, using uh, partial derivatives and, and being able to use basic multivariable calculus that really allows us to use thermodynamics to its full potential as chemists or biochemists. Um, this semester we're going to focus almost exclusively on equilibrium or uh, thermodynamics, which is often tied a lot, we'll see, versus reversible versus irreversible processes and how this plays out in entropy and other functions. But uh, defining really what equilibrium is from a microscopic level, what reversibility versus irreversibility. We'll look at some of that. And then also I think it's very critical, our gateway to, to looking at thermodynamics from an experimental practical standpoint to make measurements is often calorimetry. So we'll have a lecture just introducing some basic calorimetry concepts and uh, instrumentation, et cetera. A lot of what I'm gonna be covering will be covered uh, in a lot of detail, not only in textbooks, but I provide a, a, a set of lecture notes um, that have been uh, produced over the years uh, that are at uh, biopchem.edu under the uh, lecture note heading. So thank you for listening to this introduction to thermodynamics. I look forward uh, to uh, talking to you guys in the future.